One of the most fundamental parts of usually an advanced chemistry course is to talk about kinetics or the rates at which chemical reactions happen. There's a lot of math usually in the section and the way in which we teach it usually involves a graphical analysis, sometimes a calculus derivative method. Uh, you can also use integrated rate laws. This is well beyond the scope of a general chemistry class, but the rate at which a chemical reaction happens I think is something that's important and fundamental to any chemistry class. Students should understand the factors that cause reactions to go faster and slower. And in our everyday lives, this is one of the things that we do. If you're noticing something isn't going fast enough, students usually know that you heat it up to make it go faster. So a nice elementary reaction that you can use to demonstrate what's happening with effects of reagent concentration and with temperature is to use the blue bottle reaction. What I have here are reactions that have already been prepared. I'll demonstrate them first and I'll talk more about the chemistry in a little bit. But right now we have the same co contents. We have some methylene blue, some potassium hydroxide, some dextrose, and just water in each one of these bottles. The same concentration of all, con all solutes and all reagents is the same for every bottle. The only thing I've done different here, I have four different temperatures. One of them's at room temperature. I do one with cool water. Usually I just take the cold tap water out of my sink. Uh, I have this one on an ice water bath, and then this one is a warm water bath. Don't get this too hot. You can decompose the compounds very quickly and cause an unwanted side reaction. So this one's at about 37 Fahrenheit, or sorry, 37 Celsius. This is at 25 Celsius, this is at 15 Celsius, and this is at about 2 Celsius. So I'm going to pull all of these out of their solutions, knowing what temperature they're at. So we have about 2, 12, 25, and 38. So we've got about 10 to 12 degrees difference between each one. You can try to get exactly 10 degrees Celsius difference. I've never been able to, so I don't bother. Uh, I just get high, low, and some middle ground temperatures when I do this in class. You can also see a little bit here, this is getting yellow, so starting to decompose a little bit. Uh, these don't last very long. Now, I do need a volunteer to help me out, so Peg is going to help me. I usually, in my classroom, usually have a student come in and we just practice shaking, so that, you know, we'll, we'll do it without the flasks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, so we get used to shaking it as similarly as we can. So, ready? How many? Uh, let's go for 10. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now, one of the neat things about this reaction is right off the bat, you see a color change happening out of nothing. You just shook it. You didn't add any compounds. And all of a sudden, you noticed a color change out of nowhere. That's a pretty brilliant thing for a student to see the first time. But then the next thing we start to look at, this one's already turned back. This one's starting to fade. And then on down the line, we get more and more fading over time. So what's happening here? In the hot flask or the warmer flask, those particles have lots more kinetic energy than they have in the cold flask. So we can get lots more kinetic energy going around. These are bombarding into each other. More particles, when they collide, have enough energy to make that chemical reaction happen. So because we have more particle motion, the reaction goes more quickly. We have more energy available to make that reaction happen. Here, we don't have quite as much energy. And here, these are taking a very long time. This can take up to 10 minutes sometimes. And I usually, if this one gets really cold down to like 2 degrees, sometimes it never even changes. There's so much that's gone in here, and the molecules are moving so closely to, we're so close to a freezing point, the molecules are moving very slowly, that this one sometimes never even changes for me. So the students can get a very clear visual picture that higher temperature will allow for a higher reaction rate. So it's a really nice visual demonstration for something that kids can't usually get a good picture for. Now, this one's temperature. We can do the same thing with concentration of reagents. I mentioned that inside of these we have dextrose, we have potassium hydroxide, and the methylene blue is what you're seeing change color. That's changing color as part of this reaction. So we have different concentrations here. In one of these, I have the same mixture solution that I've always had. In one of them, I've added three extra pellets of potassium hydroxide. And in one of them, I added six extra pellets of potassium hydroxide. We're going to do the same thing, shake 10 times, and see what happens with the different concentration of potassium hydroxide in this reaction. Ready? And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So same thing. We get a blue color. And sometimes I'll use this at the beginning and I will tell my students which flask has which amount of potassium hydroxide in it. 
If I want to use this as more of an in-class assessment of whether they're catching on to what I'm talking about, sometimes I will just shake them and have them vote which one had the most potassium hydroxide, which one had a smaller amount of potassium hydroxide, and which one had no additional potassium hydroxide. So I can get a quick in-class assessment of what's going on. So we can see that this one changed first, this one changed second, and this one still has a pale blue color in it. So what's happening? The most potassium hydroxide was in my middle flask, the second most potassium hydroxide was in my side flask, and the most potassium hydroxide concentration was over here. And this one can be repeated several times, so if the kids aren't believing you on trials or you're worried somebody's shaking harder than the other, then you can explain based on what's happening with the amount of shaking or shake it longer until the students are satisfied that the results are consistent, which is always a good thing for them to do. Now, to talk a little bit about what's happening here, you can also use this as a way to start talking about reaction mechanisms. Not all chemical reactions happen in one step, even though very often in a general chemistry course we just say reactants go to products, that's it. We don't say sometimes the reactant goes here and then here and then here and then becomes here and then it becomes product at the end. We're usually just worried about the net reaction. In kinetics, though, we're interested to see what steps, and if they ever go on to take organic chemistry, everything is about reaction mechanisms and what steps happen on the way to making products. So I'm going to go to the board and look a little bit at this reaction mechanism. One of the things that you have inside of this bottle, um, I found that my students uh, in my advanced chemistry class, I just give them the blue bottle experiment at the beginning, and they hadn't seen it in my general chemistry class. I just put the bottle out there and I say make observations. Some of them will eventually shake it and suddenly it turns blue. They weren't expecting that to happen. And so that's a good inquiry experiment for them just to start asking questions and making observations the first day of class. What they don't realize, my students always think that this is the only matter inside of the bottle. They completely ignore that there's air on top and that air can participate in chemical reactions. And I think this goes back to the if you can't see it, it's not their concept. But even after a full year of chemistry, many of my kids take about half the class period before they start thinking maybe oxygen is doing something. So what happens is you have oxygen in the gas phase up here in the air. Well, oxygen can also dissolve in water. Otherwise, fish and aquatic species would have a very difficult time surviving. So it becomes from oxygen gas to aqueous oxygen. Well, once that oxygen becomes aqueous, it's free to move around here with whatever is inside of my flask. So it can react with the dextrose. It can react with the potassium hydroxide. It can react with the methylene blue. And it turns out that there are two forms of methylene blue. There's a colorless and a blue form. And I'm just going to say, to keep it simple right now, that it goes from methylene blue to the oxidized form of methylene blue. The oxidized form of methylene blue is blue. When it's not oxidized, it's colorless. Well, there's another thing. If something's becoming oxidized, something has to become reduced. So another reaction that happens, dextrose is just a form of glucose. When it goes into solution, we can treat it as the same as a glucose molecule. And what happens is the glucose with the strong basic conditions, this is about two molar potassium hydroxide, or one molar potassium hydroxide, that can become the glucoside ion. Now, if you want to go into this, into the organic chemistry, we can explain that glucose is a molecule. They mostly know that from biology, but they also tend not to have seen it in this form. They just, you know, do C6H6, or C6H12O6. And we can talk about, in basic conditions, alcohol groups can sometimes act like very weak acids, so under strong basic conditions, that hydrogen can migrate over here. You get a glucoside ion. And then this can go further and oxidize and make a carbonyl or a carbon to oxygen double bond. And at this point in time, I've lost every single student in my class. So a better way of explaining the mechanism, I think, is to get the concept across in a very visual fashion that involves no structures whatsoever. They don't even know what half of this means because they've never even taken organic chemistry or biochemistry course. So they don't recognize this molecule when I draw it this way. And I'm just putting Greek on the board for all I could do at this point. So at this point, I'm going to pull up some student volunteers and from our studio audience, and we're going to look at a more visual way to look at this as a reaction mechanism. So we'll be back in just one second.
Okay, we're back. I have all my student volunteers here. When I do this in my classroom, we actually usually go out in the hallway. I'd never have this much open space anywhere in my classroom. So we'll usually go out in the hallway and set this up here so everyone can see what's going on. It usually takes my entire class to do this, so I have enough plates for just about everyone. So we have several different student volunteers. Some here have X on their plates, some have Y. We also have gas. So what we're going to try to do is simulate what's happening inside of the blue bottle when we agitate it on the molecular level. Now, we know how gases compare to liquids in terms of density. So anyone who's a gas molecule, please exercise your density. Gases are less dense, so they're going to float to the top. So inside of our, bo our bottle, we've got lots of gas on the top of our, our liquid here. Now, the first thing that happens is we shake the bottle up. Well, when we do that, the gas molecules and the X molecules can react together. So when gas and X meet, that's when we start to see the blue color. But the interesting thing about this reaction is there's another chemical in solution here. Y competes with the gas to bond to X. So Y can invade, steal X away. The gas goes back up to the top of the solution. And X and Y are now colorless in solution when they're partnered up. So we have a competition between reactions here. So we can simulate what's happening. So let's shake our whole bottle now. So we're going to shake everything up. Gases go down. Gas and X, you guys are bonding together. Gas and X, you guys are bonding together. Uh, right here, yeah, right there. And then how about this gas and that X, you guys are going to bond together. All right, and everyone else sort of settle out. The gas will start rising back up to the top. All right. Well, now we have some blue in solution. Go ahead, stay blue here. Because it's not until Y invades and bonds with X for itself that the gas gets released to go back up to the top. And our color starts to fade over time. Likewise, this Y can go ahead and bond with that X, and the gas goes back up. And back here, do we have an X in the back somewhere, or a Y back here? All right, so this Y can come back, steal that X away, and that gas is going to start to go up. So it's a nice demonstration that students can start to visualize. I usually actually have them all facing each other so they can watch the reaction happening. It's a nice way that they can visualize what's happening without drawing a single molecular structure, without talking about reaction mechanisms in a mathematical sense. It's a really nice, elegant way to show visually what's happening. Now, we can try to answer some other questions, too. What happens if we shake more? Or we can dissolve more of that oxygen into solution. Would that change what's going to happen? So this time, we're going to dissolve more gas. So let's shake things up. Gases come on down. Gas and X, you guys are together. Gas and X, you guys are together. Uh, gas and X, you guys are together. Uh, gas and X, you guys are together. And gas and X, you guys are together. All right, everyone who's gas and X, you guys have turned blue. If a gas didn't get paired up, you're still going back up to the top. All right, not all of the gas dissolves. But now, Y is going to evade, so Y, go ahead and invade there. Um, we didn't get any over here, so Y, go ahead and invade over there. And in the back over here, Y, you can invade there. And then over here, Y, you guys can invade there. Well, what happened? If more gas dissolves, it takes a lot more time for that gas to go back up into the top of this reaction. So the more that we can get to react, we can also demonstrate the effects of concentration on the reaction or increased agitation. So you guys can put your arms down, let the blood back in. But it's a really nice, elegant demonstration of what's happening on the molecular level. I do have one other variation of this, how we can visualize things in reactions with not being able to see inside of the flask, but another way we can see what's happening on the molecular level. My, sorry, the molecular level. We're going to look at this from a computerized probe system. So we'll be back in just a second to show you the reaction using a computerized data collection system in a slightly more, more mathematical, more graphical, but not quite as visual method. We'll be back in just one second. And now I want to show you a third way that we can demonstrate the way that this reaction is functioning. I have been set up on my laptop here a computerized probe that collects the concentration of dissolved oxygen inside of a solution and a video that's been attached. So the video is embedded with the data collection software and then will play simultaneously with the data collection when you replay it. I usually demonstrate this for my students by just putting it up on the LCD projector in front of my room so they can see it or if you have a television or you can have them huddle around your computer or even do something like this and hand them CDs to take home as sort of almost a take home lab kind of experiment. But it's really neat that you can see the data being plotted as you're watching a video of the reaction happening at the same time. 
So what we're going to look at now is the rate at which the dissolved oxygen goes down into the solution and then leaves the solution and what happens to color. So we're going to switch to the overhead camera so we can see what this looks like. And you can see here that I have the bottle here. This is the dissolved oxygen probe. The data will plot over here. And then here is the playback menu so we can start the reaction. So you can see that my hand descends and shakes this up. I sped this up a little bit just so it takes a little bit more time. So this is twice the playback. But once that bottle turns blue, you can see that the dissolved oxygen increases in concentration. It then levels off. And as that blue color starts to disappear, there's less and less dissolved oxygen. So the dissolved oxygen is leaving the solution, going back up to the top part of the bottle. And then when we shake it again, we get another dark blue color. The dissolved oxygen concentration goes up. Up, that blue color starts to fade just as the dissolved oxygen starts to decrease. So you can very clearly show to the students that it is the function of the oxygen that's causing this reaction to change color. The more oxygen that gets dissolved, it takes a little bit more longer, longer for it to start to filter out of solution. And they can see a really nice graphical representation that the dissolved oxygen is responsible for the color change that they're seeing. So it is the oxidation of the methylene blue that results in this reaction. There are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind if you're going to do this reaction. This one cannot be set up the night before, because the constant, when the reactions are set next to each other, within a half an hour, they'll start to turn yellow. So what I do is I mix up the potassium hydroxide solution separately and the dextrose solution separately. And I just mix them together right before class and pour them into the flasks. You get about a half an hour of play time before it starts to turn yellow. Even if it's yellow, you can still shake it and it will turn blue. But the longer it sits, the worse it becomes. Uh, I did learn this the hard way, because I set this up the night before in my first year that I ever did this demonstration and came back the next day and every bottle was blue and I, I would freaked out and had to start all over again and I only had five minutes of my time between classes to set that up. So I would certainly recommend mixing up the potassium hydroxide solution and the dextrose solution separately, then mix them together at the last minute when you need them. Uh, you can use different indicators for this too. Riazarin will work and give you sort of a pink color rather than a blue color. So one time I even had half of the bottles that I gave my students be blue and half of the bottles be pink. Um, you do need to make sure that they are sealed very tightly. It's a fairly concentrated solution of potassium hydroxide. And if you spill it, if anyone gets on their hands, they need to wash their hands right away. I usually put a rubber stopper and wrap it in parafilm, or I actually have screw top bottles that I use for that. And then they don't, the screw tops don't ever come off, and I tell the students that. The other thing that you have to watch is when you're using methylene blue, some plastic containers, the ones that are sort of translucent, I think the polyethylene, can sometimes absorb the methylene blue. The methylene blue is a biological stain, and you are a biological person, and it will stain you as well as everything inside of your bottle. Um, so sometimes you might want to use gloves to make sure you don't get any methylene blue on your skin, uh, just so you don't get a stain. But it is a really nice dramatic demonstration that you can use to show very clearly and in a visual way the difference between concentration and its effect on reaction rate, the difference between temperatures and its effect effect on reaction rate and also start to introduce mechanisms and the fact that reactions don't happen always in just one step in a very easy to understand and contemplative way that the students can take with them as a very lasting visual image. I hope that will help your students as much as it's helped mine. Thank you.